Okay, welcome back everyone. So today's topic is on what we're calling composite functions. Uh, by this we just mean uh, composition, right? I think you've all seen this uh, circle defining composition, but we're just calling the functions which have been composed, we're calling that a composite function. And then it's very natural that the, that the result of, of uh, derivatives with composite functions will be the chain rule. So we're just going to basically cover the chain rule in higher dimensions. That's kind of the tricky thing here is uh, we need to keep dimensions in mind, okay? Because it's not as easy as your standard chain rule where you could just get away with um, you know, taking the derivative of the outside, multiplying by the derivative of the inside, and leaving it at that. Uh, you know, in higher dimensions, the chain rule has to split somehow. So we'll see how that works. Um, the The book is introducing three different sorts of composite functions here, and I'm going to talk briefly about why these are kind of the natural composite functions we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to jump over to the whiteboard for that. So just talking really quick, composite, or I'll say compositions of functions. So the only thing we have to keep in mind, keep in mind that the output of the inside function must match the input of the outside function. for somewhat natural reasons. So let's just take an example. If I have a machine which takes things in and it puts things out. If it, for example, if it takes uh, wheat in, I know you all love the analogy of wheat. Okay, so if it takes wheat in, and it outputs flour. I guess I'm drawing flour, it's just squiggly. Um, so this is, suppose this is flour, I suppose this was wheat. And I have another machine, that's my fancy bread machine. Has anybody used those before? I never like the bread out of them as much as when I make it more naturally. So this is a milling machine and a bread machine. Suppose I'm putting a flour into the bread machine and out pops bread. It's the easiest way to draw a loaf of bread. Um, there's my loaf of bread. Uh, you can imagine, ideally, we've all thought of this by now, that uh, exchanging the order of these machines makes nonsense. So I, that's that's i.e. putting wheat in a bread machine. Okay. No, you, you can't just shove wheat into a bread machine and hope bread to pop out. You can't, uh, you know, maybe something would pop out. It would be something strange. If you decided to put that strange thing in a milling machine, you're not going to get bread. So exchanging the order of these machines makes no sense. So you need the correct output. You need the correct output, in this case, flour, from the first function, which in this case was the milling machine. Right, it needs to be a valid input to the second function. So that's all we have to keep in mind when it comes to function composition. So the, the, the first output must be a valid input to, to the, uh, the second function and vice versa, right? Okay, so that's just something I want to talk about with composition of functions. So now, why, why does this apply to the cases we were seeing over here? In this case, well, let's think about the inputs and the outputs. So notably, this helps us out a little bit because uh, our notation includes vectors. So the input of gamma, you'll recall, was r, and the output of gamma was r3. And this works out because R3 is our output. If I look at F, F was a scalar field, has an input of R3 and an output of R. And so it's perfectly valid for the R3 outputs of gamma. Gamma outputs R3, 
R3 goes into F, and then and then we obtain our output. So it's like gamma was giving me the flower, which was able to go into the bread machine, and then I get whatever I need out. In this case, it's just a coincidence that what we started with R over here, and what we ended with R over here, is, that's a coincidence. Um, the starting points and the ending points might not always be the same, but you definitely need the middle two to be the same. And if we do the same thing with uh, gamma over here, no difference, gamma is going from R into R3, and the vector field that we have here, R3 comes over, it goes to the vector field, and the vector field goes from R3 to R3. Okay, but once again, what's the important takeaway is that the output of gamma was the input of the vector field. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to erase those. We can do the same thing right here. The input, which we don't really care about, of the first function was R3, but the output is R3. That's the important thing. Now the output, R3, makes sense to go into a scalar field because the input of a scalar field is R3, and then the output of the scalar field is R. But once again, the, the overall input, this first input, R3, and the last output, R, is not important, but the important thing is the middle two agree. Middle two of R3 agree in those cases. Okay, so let's scroll down. Um, recalling derivatives, right? We can the, the natural derivative on a function of only r is just the derivative in that variable. So we're taking a derivative with respect to time, and on a vector, it just passes right through the vector. We can take a derivative with respect to time of each vector. Now, if the input of our function happened to be, in this case, f, right? f, the input was r3. If there's three inputs, that means there's three total directions we can take derivatives in, and the natural derivative must include all three of those directions. So that's where we recovered the gradient. It forces us, since f has three inputs, we're forced to take three possible derivatives. Finally, the, uh, the, the, the Jacobian j of some vector v, vector field v, was a matrix. And the reason for that was that on the inputs, we had to take three possible derivatives on an input because it, it has three inputs. But the outputs of each one of those three derivatives were themselves vectors. So we have three possible derivatives and three uh, vectors of size three. So we end up with nine total um, elements. And in fact, it's a three by three matrix, right? So in general, we can think of these derivatives, which are the size of any derivative b for some function. Well, it should be, it should be the, the total number of inputs multiplied by the total number of outputs. And so with, with uh, the vector field v, we're going to have three times three. So that's going to be a three by three matrix uh, for f. A scalar field right here, we're going to have three by one. So we can either think about that as a three by one matrix or a one by three matrix, or even just a vector. And, and similarly with my curve, which uh, had, had one input, but three outputs, that's going to be one times three. So a one by three matrix or a three by one matrix or a vector, however you want to think about that. So that's where we can always make sure that we're doing the right thing, calculating derivatives. And this is going to help us a lot with composite functions, because let's think about this really quick. That's a composite function. The, the input, let's talk about input. Input, middle, and output. The input from gamma, gamma inputs an R, and it outputs an R3. F, the scalar field, inputs an R3, and it sends me to the output uh, R. So this here was gamma vector, and that's F. And if that's true, then my, my true input output of my functions are R to R using this idea of derivative. So number of derivatives is the input dimension multiplied by the output dimension. And in this case, my input dimension was one, my output dimension was one, I should have a single derivative. So let's see if we can calculate what that single derivative should be using the chain rule. Let's look at this example. So f has its three inputs x, y, z, gamma has its three outputs t, t squared, t cubed. That means f compose gamma is f of gamma is f of gamma 1 gamma 2, gamma 3, which will give me f of t, t squared, t cubed. And if I plug t 
t squared t cubed and for x, y, z, I recover the one dimensional function 2t plus 3t squared plus 4t cubed. Now this function looks exactly like the sorts of functions we were taking derivatives of in calc 1. And so this is where we can recover a one dimensional derivative. So let's keep that in mind, 2t two, two plus 3t squared plus 4t cubed. If I'm gonna take a derivative, I only have to do that in time. I'm gonna use a prime instead of a dot, hopefully that's okay with you. A derivative in time here gives me two plus six t plus 12t squared. And we notice we only have a single output for the derivative, just like we wanted. So if I take if I take this vector field, then I can have either gamma as an input, or I can have the vector field as an input into the uh, scalar field. So let's compute those. If I put gamma, now recall, I'm going to put gamma back on the, the screen so we don't forget what that is. t, t squared, t cubed, and f was 2x plus 3y plus 4z. Okay, if I'm computing this, that's this vector field, but I'm replacing x, y, c, z with the inputs of gamma. So now all of a sudden it's the vector field, x, y, z input gamma, I have gamma in x is t, gamma in y is t squared, gamma and z is t cubed, I recover the vector. Well, it's really t goes in for x, so it becomes t squared. t goes in for x, I get t minus t squared in for y. I get t, t cubed in for z. And now in z squared, that's t cubed squared, which is t to the six. So that's v of gamma. And now if I look at f of v here, I'm going to take f and now for the input on x, I'm plugging in that. This is the, the I should say, the first entry uh, in output of v. So I'm plugging in the first entry of the output of v in for the, in for the first input there. And then I'm doing the same thing for the second input, x minus y minus z. And the same for the third input, z squared. And what that means is I'm looking now, I'm comparing those three inputs with their three outputs in F, and I'm just gonna plug those numbers in. So I get two times the first input, which is x squared, plus three times the second input, which was x minus y minus z, and I get four times the third input, which is z squared. And so now you can see what V of these, uh, how V interacts with these two functions by composition. So now, now we'll focus on taking derivatives. So recall our generic chain rule where we, if we think about it, we have the inside function and the outside function. And to take a derivative, we uh, keep the inside the same. We take a derivative of the outside, and then we're gonna multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's your generic chain rule you probably should have practiced a fair bit by now. Uh, we're gonna try to find something similar for recall, recall up here. If I take derivatives of these pieces, I should come up with something that's like two plus 60 plus 12 t squared for that composition. So something I'm gonna naively do is think about each of the derivatives separately. Let's do f of gamma prime and just define this as f prime of gamma times gamma dot. And what should f prime be? Right, so this is a naive case, but I can make it a little less naive by reinterpreting f prime. If I reinterpret f prime as the gradient of f, then we start to see that this might make sense. It's the gradient of f evaluated at gamma and then a dot product with gamma prime. So we're going to see this below as well, but for now just keep this in mind that that seems like the most straightforward generalization of the chain rule. And there it is. So the straightforward generalization of the chain rule the derivative of f composed with gamma is the gradient of f at gamma, dot product, the, it's missing a dot product there, but there's a dot product against the vector of gamma. We can do the same similar thing with the Jacobian on v, because the Jacobian will be produced from the derivative on v, and then that's a matrix which can act on gamma. So I'm gonna be a little bit more clear about that right here. Let's just go naively, let's just do v circle gamma prime. I'm gonna define this right away as v prime of gamma, and then I'm gonna dot with gamma derivative. But we have to be clever and remember what v prime actually is. v prime is more general than just taking a derivative. In fact, with v, what we get to do instead of taking a derivative is take the Jacobian as a matrix. And now this looks exactly like what we would expect. 
Finally, uh, let's say here, and we'll go through the derivation. If I'm composing v with f, I'm going to do something naive, and I'm just going to take f compose v prime. I'm going to define this as f prime of v dot v prime. And I have to recall what each of these derivatives means. That prime and that prime they actually have slightly broader definitions. Those are actually the gradient when it comes to f, and the Jacobian when it comes to v. And we'll see that the output here, right? This is this is a vector. That's a matrix. As long as we're working with uh, uh, the vector having the right transpose, it can act on the matrix and produce another matrix for us, which is just what we would expect. Okay, let's actually compute some of these derivatives. So let's recall the the functions that I came up with here. So here's v. Let's calculate its Jacobian. And for those of you who don't remember, this is a matrix, and I'm just going to go row by row. I'm going to calculate each of the partial derivatives. So partial derivative in x of x squared is 2x, in y of x squared is 0, and in z of x squared is 0. The Jacobian in y of x minus y minus z, or sorry, x of x minus y minus z is 1, of y is negative 1, and of z is negative 1. Finally, uh, the derivative in x of z squared is 0, derivative of y is 0, and the derivative of z is 2, z. So there's my Jacobian of v. I'm going to calculate the gradient of f. Let's recall what f was, f of x, y, z, was 2x plus 3y plus 4z. The gradient of f is partial in x, partial in y, partial in z. And finally, recall gamma was the vector t, t squared, t cubed, and gamma dot then, gamma dot is going to be 1, 2t, uh, 3t squared. Okay, so all, all possible derivatives I can come up with are going to be derivatives of functions of the form f of gamma, which we decided as a prime was gradient f at gamma dot gamma. So we're calling the gradient of f, which is right here. Gradient of f at gamma is 2, 3, 4, and the dot, gamma dot, sorry, this is my dot earlier, is 1, 2t, 3t squared. That means my output is 2 plus 6t plus 12t squared, which is exactly what we had recovered earlier. And so our formula works great. Let's look at another composition example. Another composition example would be v of the gradient. Oh, sorry, v of gamma prime. We found out that that had to be the Jacobian at gamma dot gamma, and dot being that the matrix was acting on uh, gamma prime or gamma dot. The Jacobian matrix here is 2x, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 2, z. But if I'm evaluating this, this is a special thing, if I'm evaluating this at gamma, both of these, the variables, must be evaluated at gamma. Recall the variable x in gamma is t, the variable z in gamma is tq. So instead of placing an x into z there, I'm going to place the important things in gamma there, t and tq. And now this acts as a matrix on gamma dot, which is over here, 1, 2t, 3t squared. And I know it's been probably a little bit since we did some matrix multiplication, but what goes on in my head is I take that row, or that column, and this row, and I dot product them, which gives me uh, 2t. I then take this column and this row, and I dot product them, and I recover 1 minus 2t minus 3t squared. And finally, I take this column and that row and I dot product them, and I recover, I suppose that's 6t to the fifth. So that is my output of v with gamma prime. And just as you would expect, this is a vector. Since we had a one dimensional input into gamma and a three dimensional output from v, we have something that's one by three or three by one. And finally, let's go through the, the last possible combination, which would be f with v. So looking at the combinations of f with v, f with v prime is naturally going to be the gradient of f evaluated at v, and then we're going to have right multiplication of the matrix j, the Jacobian matrix, on v. If I recall the gradient of f, that was the vector over here, 2, 3, 4. The Jacobian j is 2x, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 2, z. And now running right matrix multiplication, I have to consider the vector on the left as actually a row vector. So I have to really take the transpose here, and maybe that should technically be in our definitions from the beginning. But that's considered as a row vector, so what's actually happening now is I'm taking the column from the right and the row on the left, and I'm taking the dot product of those, and my output becomes uh, 6, sorry, 4x plus 3. I'm then taking the dot product of the second column with my row, and I get negative 3 out of those. And thirdly, I'm taking the last column with the row and taking a dot product, and that gives me negative 3 plus 8z. And this happens to be a uh, 3 by 1 matrix, because the input of f composed with v is three-dimensional, but the output is only one-dimensional, and there's your 3 times 1 that you should receive from there. OK, so I'm pretty sure that's all I have. Let me scroll down really quick and make sure. Yep, that's all I have. So we will see you in class. Bye-bye.